Welcome to Teleforum, a podcast of the Federal Society's practice groups. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federal Society. For exclusive access to live recordings of practice group Teleforum calls, become a Federal Society member today at fedsoc.org. Welcome, everyone, to this Federalist Society Teleforum conference call. As this afternoon, May 27th, 2021, we have a litigation update on a case called Meriwether v. Hartop. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on today's call are those of our expert. We're very pleased to be joined this afternoon to review this case by Mr. Casey Maddox. He's Vice President for Legal and Judicial Strategy at Americans for Prosperity. After Casey reviews the case, goes through the recent Sixth Circuit ruling and previews where this case might go, we'll open up the floor for audience questions. So have those in mind and and get ready to ask those when we get to that portion of the call. All right. Thanks very much for being with us. Mr. Casey Maddox, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. And thanks to the Federalist Society for uh, for hosting this. Um, Hopefully this will be uh, an interesting conversation about an interesting case. Uh, in Meriwether versus Hartop, the, the Sixth Circuit recently, uh, in late March, uh, issued a noteworthy opinion um, allowing a professor's First Amendment claims to go forward against Shawnee State University, arising from its discipline of him for his refusal to use a student's preferred pronouns. Before I get into the substance of the case, here are some of the important strands of case law uh, that, uh, that sort of converge in this case. Um, first, you have the, the question about government speech, or or, uh, rather government employee speech, and its protection under the First Amendment. And there's a a case from about 15 years ago uh, in Garcetti where the Supreme Court uh, addressed a Los Angeles Police Department's discipline of a public, uh, of a a police department employee who publicly spoke out um, about the department's conduct in a specific investigation. And it held in that case that when public employees make students pursuant to their official duties, the employees are not speaking as citizens for First Amendment purposes, and the Constitution does not insulate their communications from employer discipline. Um, in dissent, uh, Justice Souter warned that Garcetti uh, could imperil First Amendment protection of academic freedom in public colleges and universities, where, of course, uh, faculty members are government employees, um, and where uh, teachers necessarily speak and write pursuant to their official duties. Uh, Justice Souter feared that professors could be punished for simply teaching uh, an unpopular or controversial subject because teaching is unquestionably within their job duty of a university professor. Uh, The Garcetti majority recognized the importance of academic freedom, uh, but uh, chose not to to decide the question. The court said uh, that it would not, quote, decide whether the analysis we conduct today would apply in the same manner to a case involving speech related to scholarship or teaching. And that has spawned several cases around the country uh, where lower courts have had to resolve this question since Garcetti, uh, so far concluding that Garcetti does not apply in the context of university faculty, um, not extending the case in this context. Uh, And so, for example, in Adams versus uh, the trustees of UNC Wilmington, the Fourth Circuit held that a university's refusal to promote a faculty member because of columns he wrote at town hall uh, and, and other comments that he had made were not covered uh, by Garcetti, and so uh, the normal uh, the normal test for public employee free speech applied. Um, so where Garcetti doesn't apply under the Pickering conic analysis, a government employee's speech is protected if the speech relates to a matter of public concern and if the employee's First Amendment uh, interest outweighs the government's need for efficiency as an employer. So that's one big issue in this case, compelled speech. Obviously, uh, this is a, a case where uh, the, the school is not restricting him from speaking. It's ordering him to speak. Uh, and so in Janus, Nipla, Hurley, and other decisions in recent years, recent decades even, the um, Supreme Court has been particularly uh, strong in defending against uh, compelled speech. And, and that's essentially what's uh, you know, the, the type of First Amendment issue uh, at stake here. Uh, there's a free exercise claim in this case as well. Obviously, the Supreme Court is presently considering uh, a major case on the free exercise clause in the Fulton case that uh, at least could potentially mean that uh, Employment Division versus Smith is overturned or at least modified in some way. Um, 
and that will be uh, relevant to the to the ultimate analysis of the the pre exercise claims in this case. But even under the existing law from Masterpiece Cake Shop and and uh, other cases that the court has recently decided, um, particularly under the shadow docket, the uh, under the free exercise clause, the court has has been particularly um, careful recently to say that expressions of hostility against religion can undermine the general applicability uh, of a government action. And then, of course, you have Title VII, Title IX, uh, and decisions interpreting sex to include gender identity, uh, which also uh, is, is obviously a, a significant part of uh, the backdrop of this case. So first, I'll lay out the facts at issue. And because this is a motion to dismiss, of course, uh, the Sixth Circuit had to accept the facts pleaded as true. So we'll also do that here uh, and makes it, uh, my job slightly easier um, and describe the case as it came to the Sixth Circuit um, as, the, as the, the court itself laid it out and as the pleadings lay the case out. Nicholas Merriweather is a philosophy, philosophy professor at Shawnee State, small public college in Ohio. He's been at the school for 25 of the 30 years that Shawnee State has awarded degrees, serving in the faculty senate, uh, and otherwise has been a, a mainstay of, uh, of the university uh, during his time. Um, up until the uh, incident that triggered the lawsuit here, he has had no disciplinary record of any kind. Um, he is a devout Christian. He believes that um, God created human beings as male and female, uh, that sex is fixed in each person from the moment of conception, and it can't be changed. He also believes that he can't uh, affirm things that are uh, true ideas and concepts that are not true, but affirm as true things that are not true. Being faithful to his religion uh, has never been a problem at Shawnee State until 2016, uh, according to the pleadings. At the start of the first of the school year, uh, Shawnee State had emailed faculty informing them that they had to refer to students by their preferred pronouns. Meriwether asked university officials for more, more details about this new pronoun policy, and they confirmed that professors would be disciplined if they refused to use a pronoun that reflects a student's self-asserted gender identity. The policy applied regardless, uh, and the, uh, the, the communication from the school specifically said that the policy applies regardless of the professor's convictions or views on the subject. Meriwether asked to see the revised policy, uh, but university officials uh, simply pointed him to the school's existing policy, prohibiting discrimination because of gender identity. So there had not been a promulgation of a, of a different policy uh, specifically on this point. This is an interpretation of the prior policy. Uh, that policy applies to all of the university's employees, students, visitors, agents, and volunteers. It applies at both academic and non-academic events, applies on all university property, including classrooms, dorms, and athletic fields, and in some cases, it applies off campus. So it's a pretty broad policy um, that is uh, uh, that, that the school was interpreting to apply in this context. When Meriwether approached his department um, chair, According to the pleadings, she was derisive and scornful, uh, said that Christians are primarily motivated out of fear. Uh, that is a, that's a quote. And should be, quote, banned from teaching courses regarding that religion, unquote. She added that the presence of religion in higher education is, in her view, counterproductive. Meriwether continued to teach students without incident until January 2018. Uh, he uses the Socratic method in class to lead discussion in his course on political philosophy. And when using that method, he addresses students uh, as Mr. or Mrs. Um, he's done this for years. He believes that this is a more formal manner of addressing students, helps them to view the academic enterprise uh, more seriously, uh, with more weighty approach, uh, and it fosters an atmosphere of mutual respect. He's found that addressing students in this fashion is uh, is an important pedagogical tool, and so that's uh, the, the, the system that he uses. In that first class, one of the students Meriwether called on uh, was a student we will refer to here as Doe. Uh, by outward appearance, uh, Doe presented as male. In his view, and uh, at least according to the pleadings, there's nothing that would uh, that would have otherwise indicated. Meriwether responded to a question from Doe by saying, "Yes, sir." This was Meriwether's first time meeting Doe, uh, and he had no other information from the school about Doe. After class, Doe approached Meriwether 
and uh, demanded that Meriwether refer to Doe uh, as a woman using feminine titles and pronouns. According to the pleadings, um, this is obviously a, a, a key aspect here. According to the pleadings, Meriwether paused before responding um, because he, he felt that his uh, sincere religious beliefs prevented him from communicating messages about gender identity uh, that he believed were false. He was surprised and paused in, in the way he responded. He explained that he wasn't, he then explained that he was, wasn't sure if he could comply with Doe's demands. Uh, Doe then became hostile um, and approached him in a threatening manner and then said, uh, and I, I will uh, see if I can figure out a way to, to frame this. Uh, I, I guess this means I can call you and uh, used a slur that is, uh, would be um, a, a common gendered slur um, aimed at, uh, uh, aimed more commonly at women, if that's vague enough. Um, Doe threatened uh, to get Meriwether fired. Meriwether reported the incident to senior university officials, uh, and uh, they then informed their Title IX office of the incident. Uh, they met with Doe and escalated the complaint uh, to the dean. The dean went to Meriwether the next day, where she advised that he eliminate all sex-based references from his expression. Um, so no he or she, him or her, Mr. or Mrs., and so on. Meriwether pointed out that eliminating pronouns altogether was next to impossible, um, especially when teaching, so he proposed a compromise. He would keep his pro using pronouns to address most students in class, but would refer to Doe using only Doe's last name. Uh, the dean, dean accepted that compromise, apparently believing uh, that, it, uh, that that actually was in compliance with the university's gender identity policy. Doe continued to attend and participate in, in the class, um, but remained dissatisfied, and two weeks into the semester, complained uh, again to university officials. This time, the dean told Meriwether that if he did not address Doe as a woman, he would be violating the university's policy. Soon after, Meriwether uh, then accidentally, according to the complaint, referred to Doe using the title Mr. before immediately correcting himself. Uh, Doe then complained to the Title IX coordinator and threatened to retain counsel if the university didn't take action. Uh, the dean once again came to Meriwether, uh, reiterated her earlier demands. Uh, Meriwether asked whether the university's policy would allow him uh, to use students' preferred pronouns but place a disclaimer in his syllabus that noted that he was doing so under compulsion and setting forth his, uh, his own views on the question. Um, the dean rejected that option. Uh, she insisted that putting a disclaimer in his syllabus would, uh, would itself violate the university's gender identity policy. As the semester proceeded, uh, Meriwether continued uh, to look for some form of accommodation, um, but uh, Shawnee State uh, refused those uh, suggestions for accommodations. Uh, dean had, had, the dean had sent Meriwether another formal letter stating he must address Doe in the same manner as other students who identify themselves as female, unquote. Uh, the letter said if Meriwether did not comply, the university may conduct an investigation and subject him to, uh, to disciplinary action. Then just a few days later, without any response from Meriwether, uh, the dean announced that she was, in fact, initiating a formal investigation uh, because of uh, another complaint from a student in Meriwether's class. It turns out that complaint was also from uh, from the same student from Doe. Uh, Meriwether asked for an accommodation. The dean refused. Uh, she then told him he had two options, uh, stop using all sex-based pronouns in referring to students or refer to Doe as female. Uh, the dean referred the matter to the Title IX office, and after several months, the office interviewed Four witnesses, Meriwether, Doe, uh, and two other transgender students uh, at the school, the timeline office, uh, determined that Meriwether's disparate treatment of Doe had created a hostile environment in violation of the non-discrimination policies. The Title IX report concluded that because Doe perceives himself, uh, perceived himself as a female, and because Meriwether has refused to recognize that identity, uh, that he had uh, created a hostile environment. Over the course, uh, the, the report did not address Do or, or Meriwether's uh, religious objections um, and his, uh, his arguments against uh, using uh, the student's preferred pronouns. The dean determined that in order to create a, quote, safe educational experience for all students, it was necessary to discipline Meriwether 
uh, and she recommended placing a formal warning, warning in his file. The provost was tasked with reviewing the disciplinary recommendation uh, before it was imposed. Meriwether wrote the provost a letter stating that he treated Doe exactly the same as he treated all male students, um, and he began referring to Doe without pronouns and by Doe's last name as an accommodation. Meriwether also again explained uh, his religious convictions. The provost uh, approved the recommendation of disciplinary action, uh, and Shawnee State placed the written warning in Meriwether's file. Uh, the warning reprimanded Meriwether, directing him to change the way he addressed his transgender students uh, to avoid uh, any further corrective actions, which could include uh, suspension without pay and termination. Through the process, um, uh, over the, the course of the year, uh, the, the student uh, stayed in the class uh, and ultimately uh, was active in the class, participating in the class, and received a high grade in the class um, from Professor Meriwether. So, uh, which will also be uh, relevant later. Um, after the, uh, the the warning was issued and placed in his file, the Shawnee State Faculty Union actually filed a grievance on Meriwether's behalf and asked the university to vacate the action. Uh, the provost who was who had reviewed the original decision was then tasked with deciding the grievance. The provost at this uh, at this meeting, uh, according to the pleadings, repeatedly interrupted the red, the representative. Um, and refused to discuss the academic freedom and uh, other First Amendment issues in the case. At one point during the hearing, uh, the provost, quote, openly laughed, according to the complaint, while the union rep explained uh, his academic freedom and religious objections. Provost denied the grievance. The next step would have been an appeal to uh, the president of uh, the university. Uh, but just after the provost denied the grievance, he was then appointed as interim university president. So he designated two of his representatives to review the decision on his behalf. Those officials agreed uh, with the union with the union that Meriwether's conduct had not created a hostile educational environment, but they nevertheless recommended a ruling against Meriwether saying that this was not really a hostile environment case. After all, it was instead a differential treatment case. Um, this change in theory had contract contradicted the uh, original Title IX investigation and the disciplinary decision, both of which uh, had been on the basis of a creating a hostile environment for Doe. University uh, officials justified um, the uh, refusal to accommodate Meriwether's religious beliefs, uh, saying that they were uh, or comparing them to a hypothetical faculty member who would also have um, objections on the, the race or, or gender discrimination issues uh, the provost, now the president, adopted the findings and denied the grievance again. That was the end of the, pro the, the process at Shawnee State. Um, and so uh, the result of the, uh, the warning in his file is that, uh, according to the pleadings, is that essentially the next time something like this happens, he is potentially subject to, um, to being suspended without pay or to, uh, to being terminated. Um, it would also make it difficult for him to be able to get a position at another school. So Meriwether, through his attorneys at ADF, uh, alleged that the university had violated his rights under the free speech and free exercise clauses, uh, the due process and equal protection clauses, um, and other state claims, uh, state and, and contract claims. District court referred the case to a magistrate judge. Uh, Doe and another organization, uh, Sexuality and Gender Acceptance, then moved to intervene, uh, and all of the defendants filed uh, 12B6 motions. The magistrate, re magistrate recommended uh, dismissing all of Meriwether's claims, uh, and the, the district court adopted that recommendation. So this gets us to the Sixth Circuit uh, decision. Sixth Circuit panel was judges. Uh, the, uh, Judge Thapar, McKeague, and Larson. Uh, Thapar wrote the unanimous panel decision. Uh, it begins by rejecting the district court's holding that faculty speech in the classroom is unprotected by the First Amendment. Um, citing the Supreme Court's rejection of compelled speech in Janus and, and other cases in recent years, the panel said that without genuine freedom of speech, the search for truth is stymied and ideas and debates necessary for the continuous improvement of our republic cannot flourish, unquote. Uh, the court said that free speech protections in universities, um, in the, uh, the First Amendment apply to universities, uh, obviously citing 
many cases to that effect. However, the panel then turned to the key issue in this and other faculty speech cases, uh, the Scarcetti question. Uh, free speech rules obviously apply, uh, as, we, as I mentioned before, apply differently when the government is doing the speaking, and that remains true when a government employee is doing the talking. Um, thus, in uh, Garcetti uh, versus Ceballos in 2006, as I mentioned before, the Supreme Court had held that, uh, quote, when public employees make statements pursuant to their official duties, the employees are not speaking as citizens for First Amendment purposes, and the Constitution does not insulate their communications from employer discipline, end quote. Um, so how does Garcetti affect academic freedom? That's the open question. Um, noting that Garcetti had expressly declined to address whether its analysis would apply, quote, to a case involving speech related to scholarship or teaching, unquote, the panel concluded that Garcetti was, in a, it was inapplicable. Um, that brings the Sixth Circuit into line with the Fourth, Fifth, and Ninth Circuits that have all uh, had uh, rejected university attempts to extend Garcetti uh, to limit the free speech and academic freedom rights of faculty members uh, over the last 15 years. The court traced the Supreme Court's reminders of the special place universities are supposed to play uh, in our society, went to the 1957 uh, decision, uh, in Sweezy versus New Hampshire, where the, the New Hampshire officials had sought a access to classroom content uh, of New Hampshire uh, professors in order to determine whether uh, the, the lectures were, uh, quote, subversive, unquote. Supreme Court uh, said then that the essentiality of freedom in the community of American universities um, uh, or affirmed the essentiality of freedom in the community of American universities, unquote, and said that a faculty member's quote, right to lecture, unquote, was beyond dispute. Uh, about a decade later in Kiyishian versus Board of Regents, the court had again rejected attempts to limit the First Amendment, uh, the First Amendment's application to subversive faculty characterizing academic freedom as a special concern of the First Amendment and saying that the First Amendment does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. Uh, Sweezy and Kiyishian, uh, the, the Sixth Circuit panel held, Establish that the First Amendment protects the free speech rights of professors when they are teaching, end quote. Reviewing its own holdings, the panel held, uh, simply put, professors at public universities retain First Amendment protections at least when engaged in core academic functions such as teaching and scholarship. I'm emphasizing why this must be the case. The court wrote, if professors lacked free speech protections when teaching, a university would wield alarming power to compel ideological conformity. A university president could require a pacifist to declare that war is just, a civil rights icon to condemn the freedom writers, a believer to deny, to deny the existence of God, or a Soviet immigrate to address his students as comrades. That cannot be, unquote. The university and the interveners responded uh, that Garcetti applies and that the court's decisions on academic freedom in Sweezy, Kiyishian, and all of these cases that had come before Garcetti um, are, now in a, are now inapplicable. Um, the panel rejected that uh, invitation, saying that it remains bound by what the Supreme Court uh, has said and its own precedent uh, on academic freedom. Uh, the defendants and the interveners also argued that the use of pronouns in the classroom is simply not a matter of academic freedom, um, that it's, it's essentially uh, more of a um, ministerial type of an act. The panel rejected that argument, saying that Meriwether's use of pronouns uh, is about how he leads a classroom discussion. And that shapes uh, the content uh, by refusing even to allow Meriwether to, to discuss the question in his syllabus, it has shut off what could have been a robust discussion in the classroom, uh, according to the panel. Um, and then it, the panel also notes that the same power that the defendants uh, and, and interveners would assert over faculty would also allow them uh, a, another um, university or state legislature, I guess, for that matter, uh, to similarly take the position that uh, the faculty were prohibited uh, from using students' preferred pronouns. Um, and there does not seem to be a response to that argument from, uh, from the school. Thus, Garcetti can apply because the need for the, uh, for the free exchange of ideas in the college classroom is unlike that in other public workplace settings and professors in class speech to the students is anything but speech by an ordinary government employee, according to the Sixth Circuit. 
the panel rejected the attempt, uh, also rejected the attempt by the university to make academic freedom only the province of the school itself. This has been um, you know, an open question to some degree. Um, when we say academic freedom, do we mean the academic freedom of the institution or of the faculty members? Uh, the, uh, the university here tried to argue that academic freedom was the province of the school itself. Uh, the Sixth Circuit rejected that argument. Um, the defendants then argued that Meriwether's speech was nevertheless unprotected under the uh, conic pickering framework. So uh, as I mentioned before, if Garcetti doesn't apply, then the standard uh, policy for government employee speech uh, is, is now the question. Uh, and the, uh, under the conic pickering uh, approach, the, uh, under Pickering, the panel needs to balance the interests of the professor as a citizen in commenting upon matters of public concern and the interests of the state as an employer in promoting the efficiency of the public services it performs <coughs> through its employees. Uh, Connick is, is also concerned with uh, whether or not the speech is, in fact, on a matter of public concern. Um, on one side, the court, um, uh, as to, to whether it was uh, a matter of public concern, the court says, look, uh, it quotes an amicus brief filed by, I think, uh, about 100 different faculty members saying that in this context, the speech, uh, quote, concerns a struggle over the social control of language in a crucial debate about the nature and foundation or indeed real existence of the sexes. Um, the, the court also points out that, of course, the fact that we were even here, uh, that the university itself thinks this is a hot issue uh, is helps to demonstrate that this is, is, in fact, a matter of public, public concern. Um, under the Pickering test, uh, that the court recounts the arguments about the importance of academic freedom for society, for the students in the classroom, and for the faculty member um, himself, saying that these are, are weighty interests. Uh, it then looks at the university's interest in preventing discrimination uh, against transgender students. Uh, the panel distinguished between uh, an interest in preventing discrimination, uh, employment discrimination under Title VII, um, which uh, the Supreme Court and the Sixth Circuit recently uh, addressed, and authorizing government to compel speech um, on these uh, on these issues here, um, and said that there is not an interest in the in the former or in the latter, uh, um, just because uh, or a compelling interest in the latter because there is an interest in the former. Um, on the facts, the panel goes back to the fact that Meriwether had offered a compromise that he initially, that was in fact initially accepted by the dean and that Doe participated in class under that plan and in fact received a high grade, um, seeming to disprove that there had in fact been a hostile environment uh, that prevented Doe's ability to receive an education. Uh, there's no evidence at this stage the panel held uh, that Meriwether's speech actually inhibited his duties in the classroom or hampered the operation of the school um, or denied Doe any educational benefits. Um, without that, uh, the school's actions uh, quote, mandate orthodoxy, not anti-discrimination, unquote, and ignore that, quote, tolerance is a two-way street, which is uh, the, the Sixth Circuit quoting its own opinion from a decade or so ago uh, in, in the Ward case. Um, thus, the balance was in favor of Meriwether on his free speech claim. Um, as to uh, the free exercise claim, um, under Smith, neutral and generally applicable rules are not subject to strict scrutiny even where they burden religious exercise, uh, but under Lukumi, Masterpiece Cake Shop, and others, um, hostility may be evidence of a lack of neutrality. According to the court under Masterpiece Cake Shop, Meriwether uh, was entitled to a neutral decision maker who would give full and fair consideration to his religious objection uh, as he sought to assert it in all the circumstances of his case. Uh, and recounting the facts, the court did not believe uh, that he had had that uh, sort of a, a neutral decision maker. Um, Court also noted irregularities, uh, the fact that the, the basis for the violation had changed up to the, to the last minute uh, from it being a, a uh, hostile environment claim uh, and then suddenly becoming a uh, differential treatment claim at the very end. Um, and it said that he had shown enough, uh, enough there to be able to get past uh, the motion to dismiss stage on his pre-exercise claims. Applying strict scrutiny, then the court didn't. Uh, uh, the, the school didn't even argue that its uh, requirements would comply um, with uh, with, strict, with strict scrutiny as to the free exercise claim. Uh, so, uh, implications of the case. Uh, well, well, first, let me say that uh, as to current status, um, the 
the defendants have filed a uh, motion for rehearing on Bonk. I believe that uh, ADF is supposed to respond to that within the next uh, week or so. Uh, a number of amicus briefs have been filed um, on behalf of the school uh, at that process uh, in that process. So that will be the the next big step in this case is whether the the Sixth Circuit takes the case on Bonk. Um, implications of this case, I, I think uh, the implications would be stronger if uh, if the court had gone the other way, because I mentioned before, this is, I believe, now the fourth case where uh, a court of appeals has said that uh, the Garcetti decision does not apply to university faculty members. Um, it is noteworthy to me that, um, you know, while there are uh, sort of some odd bedfellows on an issue like this, um, some of the major organizations one might expect to weigh in on uh, on issues of academic freedom uh, have, at least as far as I can tell, have so far not weighed in on this case uh, at this point. Um, at, with that, I think I will stop there and see what questions we have, uh, make sure we have a, a good amount of time to, to get those answered. Great. Thanks for that great Thanks, overview, sure. Casey. We'll open the floor now uh, for questions. And we've got one question that just popped up. Okay, first caller. Uh, hi, it's Sean Gates. Uh, it's a very interesting topic to me because uh, I helped try the case, uh, helped ADF try the Jack Phillips case, and uh, we ended up having to uh, do a trial without referring to the plaintiff uh, with any by any pronoun, <laughs> so, which is challenging. Um, but my question is, uh, what are the implications of the Sixth Circuit's decision for uh, other areas, um, you know, workplace issues, uh, you know, the lawyers in front of courts, uh, et cetera, because the, as you described it, it sounded as though it's very narrow and very much focused on academic freedom. So, uh, but when I, I remember reading the, uh, some of the language in the case, it seemed, you know, pretty broad uh, application of First Amendment rights. So where does it land and what are the implications for other areas outside of universities? That's a that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I think the the, the uh, there's kind of two two tracks on that. One is public employees, and then everybody else, right? Um, as to, to public employees, you know, I'm I am um, I, I will say that I personally am not a big fan of Garcetti. I'm not a, a big fan of the the uh, stricter limitations that it placed on uh, government employee speech. Um, but Garcetti remains the law, and so uh, as to uh, to other other government employees, I think uh, you know outside the the academic freedom context, Garcetti would uh, would almost surely apply. You would then so that it's going to be difficult, I think, for other government employees to be able to make a uh, a strong First Amendment claim. Um, but as to as to the uh, to the others, I mean, certainly the the language from the court's opinion. Uh, is strong in in you know support of uh, free free speech rights, um, and you do have the language that um, you know I'm sure that would be picked up on that uh, sort of distinguishes the difference between um, a uh, mandating uh, you know non discrimination in employment versus uh, you know have uh, limiting First Amendment rights, right? Um, so I, I think that would probably be picked up on in you know in a, in a different kind of case that that these are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, government discrim prohibiting discrimination by employers employers and um, doesn't necessarily mean you you must uh, limit First Amendment rights in the process. So, um, but I, you know I think we'll, we'll have to wait to see the the context in which those cases arise. I guess. And then when when you said uh, other. Em Public employees. I'm not deeply familiar with Garcetti, but um, so for other public employees, you know, if they're required, for example, just in the day-to-day, -day, you know, activities of their employment to, you know, refer to others by their preferred pronoun, would would that come under Garcetti? Or is it only when they're uh, kind of speaking on behalf in some way? Uh, for the the government, 
Yeah. So, so give, restate that again for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering um, for public employees, you know, right. it, in the day to day world, they're going to be required by, you know, these anti-discrimination um, policies to refer to other employees, for example, by or maybe even, uh, well, start with other employees by their preferred pronoun, right. which seems to me, you know, kind of non-public speech, if you will. And so I'm asking whether Garcetti would apply to that, or does it only apply to, for example, when those public employees are interacting with the public or somehow speaking on behalf of the government? Yeah, I mean, I guess in in that, so Garcetti, I think, would be principally aimed at situations where people are speaking, um, <laughs> you know, outside of the, the government context, because in, in most cases, even under the conic Pickering analysis. If your if your speech is kind of entirely internal, it would be harder to make a, a case for uh, the you know the matter of public concern argument uh, because that that looks a, a lot more like a um, you know a workplace dispute uh, kind of problem, right? So it, it may be that the answer is it would be difficult to uh, to have a First Amendment claim uh, in those cases, but for different reasons. One because if uh, you are sort of acting as a government employee, even for speaking externally. Um, Garcetti is going to apply and say you're you're, you're essentially on the clock, um, and so therefore you don't have free speech rights in the same way. Um, and then in uh, in other contexts where you have, you know, where you're speaking internal uh, to other government employees, um, it's, you're just going to have a much more difficult time making a, a sort of traditional First Amendment claim. Um, because you're, you're likely not speaking on a matter of public concern. Okay, and then, and I guess lastly, what are the implications for this for the kind of religious accommodation jurisprudence under um, Title Seven? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I, you're, you're speaking specifically there, I guess, of uh, you know, uh, as it would apply, I, I would assume to private employers, right? Sure. Let's start there. That, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it will be a, a uh, you know, a lot of the language in the case is obviously aimed at the uh, government employee speech Garcetti problem. And so a lot of it, you know, a, a lot of even the, the really strong free speech language is uh, talking about the importance of academic freedom and uh, faculty speech and, and those kinds of things. But um, I mean, I, I think that there is, you know, again, that this the point in the case, uh, in the opinion that distinguishes between um, Title VII mandating in, uh, employment non-discrimination and uh, that not necessarily having anything to, to say as to, uh, you know, the free speech rights of, of people, I think will be will probably be something that we will see cited. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Great. We'll go on to our next question. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, unfortunately, I joined a little late, and, and uh, so I'm going to definitely need to download the uh, the podcast recording if one's going to be made of this to, to catch everything you provided. Um, <clears throat> so this was a uh, survival of uh, a, uh, a summary judgment motion. So obviously, it's uh, you know a long way from from presidential, and obviously only limited to the Sixth Circuit. Um, just curious about sort of the 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 strength of the rest of the case. I think I heard you say something other about um, the possibility of the Sixth Circuit rehearing it on bonk. Um, and then I don't know whether right. it's likely to you know, be picked up by the Supremes after that. Um, but uh, it, I'm wondering, you know, it seems like if it's not, if it's not, you know, an erosion of, of the Plymouth Division versus Smith, at least it's a, um, you know, a path around, uh, you know, in certain circumstances, you know, public, uh, you know, for public academics, I guess, it, um, and whether it can be expanded beyond that. Um, how how strong do you think the case is going to be, you know, sort of on the merits now that we've got past, gotten past the summary judgment? And, you know, do, do you, any opinion about its efficacy in, in you know, in providing a path around Smith? Yeah. Yeah, and, and to clarify, too, this is actually on a motion to dismiss even, so it's even <laughs> a notch below. Oh, okay. Um, a, a summary judgment motion. Um, so, uh, you know, so we're having to accept the facts as as pleaded. To your point, uh, you know, so it, it, I, I don't have much of a reason to say why that's, uh, you know, um, have no reason to, to doubt the facts as pleaded. I guess um, that's, you know, uh, will obviously be 
important going forward uh, uh, in this case. And, you know, I think on the, my guess would be, and I, you know, others can, can tell me that, um, that I'm wrong here, but I would be surprised if the Sixth Circuit took a, you know, took up a case where it was uh, a three nothing panel opinion um, and on an issue where it's now in line with, uh, at least on the Garcetti question, uh, where it would seem to be in line with uh, the views of three other circuits. I don't think there's a circuit split at this point. Um, you know, I think the, you know, the, the, as I read this, this is basically a, uh, a question left open by the Supreme Court in Garcetti that uh, four circuits have now uh, answered that there is not a, um, that Garcetti doesn't apply in the university context. I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, for, for, uh, that people people will explain to me how there is in fact a uh, you know at least some sliver of a of a conflict um, on some aspect, but um, I I would think on the on the free speech claim that it's it would be difficult to make that case on the free exercise claim. You know, uh, my guess is that we will probably end up with uh, that at least a lot of the the ways that the court is talking about the free exercise claim uh, will have to be. Uh, kind of rethought in a few weeks after we get a Fulton decision and we see how that applies. Um, so it may very well be that this isn't the vehicle to address that question, largely because there's another vehicle sitting before the court that will will largely reshape the way we we think about the free, free exercise issues. Got it. And if I could hit a quick follow up as well. Um, it, it, so I'm just since this is uh, being addressed as a you know a uh, free exercise context for a public academic. Um, if you sort of flip, flip the script and said, well, what if it was a private institution and it was uh, an academic, let's say a religiously affiliated institution and an academic mm -hmm. there was um, insisting on uh, uh, using, uh, you know, taking the opposite position. Um, right. uh, mm -hmm. it, it, I, I, it seems as though the you know the way the law is developing, it wouldn't necessarily sort of cut the other way, um, because you know it sounds like uh, Garcetti is is focused on public institutions, whereas a private institution might have more control over over its uh, its faculty in that regard. Yeah, that's right. So you know, I think in the the private university context, you'd have um, the the you know two major issues uh, to address would be you'd have a, a freedom of association type claim right for the the school itself um you know if you had a religious school or something and it had a position on this question you had a faculty member who was uh doing something contra the instruction from the school um you don't have so much first amendment the, the kind of first amendment interest would be different if you had government trying to uh, require something of the school you obviously have a, a you know a uh, its own First Amendment uh, interests at stake, uh, free exercise or, or freedom of association. And then on the, uh, but then the, the other kind of, you know, strand there, I mean, we do, we, there was the, the, the case recently out of Wisconsin uh, where, uh, against Marquette University, where Marquette had contractual uh, promises of academic freedom for its faculty members. And then uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, Court ultimately decided that the court had uh, had failed to hold of its uh, its side of the bargain in the contract, right? So you could certainly still have contractual uh, claims against religious schools or or any other uh, where they've made promises of academic freedom uh, sufficiently clear enough uh, that it's you know it's a, a real contractual obligation and then sort of reneged on those promises. Interesting. Interesting. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Fasc fascinating update. Uh, got, to, got to try to watch the case as it moves forward. All righty. We have a next question. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, my understanding is that the, the process by which we get here is through a Title IX internal investigation and, uh, and eventually um, a collective bargaining agreement uh, uh, process. Um, my, my question to you uh, would be um, how much of uh, these different internal grievance procedures should we be looking at with regard to this? Thank you. And I, I'm sorry, I missed the very end of that. How much should we be looking at? <clears throat> so so th there's a, a lot to be said about 
exactly how, how we get here, right? My understanding was right. this was a, a Title IX, and then eventually it it, be, it goes through a collective bargaining ag- agreement uh, right. where the, the, the... Okay, and so um, how much should we be looking toward these different grievance procedures and, and so forth to try to uh, uh, um, understand um, how this will, will come out? Basically... Um, the, the the question being, should we t- setting aside the issue of, of pronouns and and so forth, kind of a, a very unique set of right. circumstances, on more brass tacks, um, right? Because one would expect some very narrow ruling on something that the, the the court hasn't dealt with before quite so directly. At least that's my understanding. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, the you know, I think where those um, where that process really comes in, the principal place where it comes in is, uh, you know, on the free exercise claim, the, the court noting, uh, I guess on the free speech claim too, the court noting the uh, the sort of diversions from what the process was supposed to be, um, which sort of created opportunities for the school to be able to make individualized judgments, um, which, you know, raises problems under the free exercise uh, jurisprudence if the school is able to sort of insert those uh, you know, individualized judgments on, um, you know, whether whether a religious accommodation is going to be acceptable or not, and has a lot of discretion to be able to make that call. So I think that's, you know, one aspect um, of the, the kind of internal process and, and the way it matters. But I mean, it, you know, at this point in the case, I think, um, you know, the, the internal process has essentially wrapped up, right? So it's not as if there is, uh, you know, anything else that could happen within the school to help resolve this, you know, that would play out going forward. The school has, you know, uh, began the process, went through its internal process, reached a final determination, and then uh, placed letter and file, um, you know, uh, pursuant to that process. And it's the placing of the letter in the file that becomes the the basis for the, for the litigation. So I'm not sure if it'll have, you know, if there's any kind of uh, anything more to watch on that going forward other than, you know, I think as you, you look at the process here, it's probably a good reminder that, you know, when you, when you set out a process and then have uh, challenges along the way with following that process, uh, and it's often the case with kind of internal processes where, you know, uh, no one wants to, to address the, the constitutional questions or the accommodation questions uh, that arise. I've, I've seen this in other cases like this where, uh, usually, even in the government context, the sort of lower level government employees want to, you know, determine the facts and apply the facts, and they don't want to address, you know, what are the First Amendment arguments, uh, you know, in this case. Uh, and I think that was part of the, that, at least at this point, is part of the problem for the school, uh, simply the sort of refusal of, of people uh, in this process to assess those, uh, those academic freedom or uh, religious liberty arguments as they uh, as they apply, thinking of it as a, a, you know sort of a more ministerial kind of uh, investigation and application of their policy. So hopefully that, that at least partially answers your question. No, I, it, it certainly does. And just a quick follow up: the different thresholds of these internal processes is not necessarily the something we should be looking towards then at any point in time. It's a lot more with regards to the final result as a package. I, I think that's right, except for that. Uh, I mean, I think that's the, you know, the, the basis for the, for the lawsuit, but those, that internal process can end up, you know, creating some of the, the legal issues that the, um, you know, that are important to that final result. Um, you know, where you, you have the decision maker has not, um, you know, appropriately considered certain factors, uh, that's going to raise questions about hostility, um, where the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, they made a determination on, you know, one theory and then changed that at the end, then potentially that raises questions about that. You know, did, did he have, um, you know, was, was his, uh, does that help to demonstrate hostility under the free exercise clause? Um, if the, you know, the, the, process changed, but nevertheless, same result, uh, or the theory changed, but with the same result, uh, only at the very end. Uh, so I, th- I think it can be relevant, but it, it, you know, at this point, I think if the case goes on, it will be mostly focused on, on, 
you know, uh, the result is letter in file. Perfect. Thank you. So, Casey, no questions right now. The floor is open. We've got about six minutes left. Um, I'll hand the floor back to you. If you want to offer any closing remarks, I'll let you know if we have a question that pops up. I think that's basically it on my end if we don't have any other questions. So, um, you know, I think this will be a, an interesting case to follow. Uh, I don't know of, uh, you know, of uh, a number of other cases that are at a, at a similar posture at this point um, to be tracked. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I think the only other thing I would say is it's, you know, you, you have faculty members on uh, one side of this case weighing in for Professor Merriweather, uh, individual faculty members around 100 or so. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm always interested in these cases by the degree to which, um, you know, if you sort of took the facts out of this case, if we knew nothing about this case, you knew that this was faculty member being sanctioned for something that he refused to say in classroom, uh, you would expect um, uh, perhaps a different lineup of amici. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, just kind of a, an interesting uh, aspect of the way these cases tend to play out. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for your coverage. Uh, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank you, Casey, for the benefit of your valuable, valuable time and expertise this afternoon. I think we'll close out a couple minutes early. Um, thanks to our audience for calling in for your great questions. As a reminder, we welcome your feedback on these programs and others um, uh, by emailing info at fed-soc.org. Also, check your emails on our website for announcements about upcoming teleforum calls like this one and Zoom events and uh, other things. So we hope to see you there. Until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you for listening to this episode of Teleform, a podcast of the Federalist Society's practice groups. For more information about the Federalist Society, the practice groups, and to become a Federalist Society member, please visit our website at fedsoc.org.